Well, it's a pleasure to be with you all in the Lord's house this morning. And if you have your Bibles, would you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 with me? 2 Corinthians chapter 6. This morning, looking uh, in the scripture, uh, I struggled a, a little bit to uh, bring this message uh, to everyone here. Uh, it's on a, a topic that's very relevant to us uh, in this church, and uh, it's something that uh, I hadn't quite realized how um, uh, how bad things uh, had gotten, uh, even in. Uh, our own Baptist circles, and uh, it's something I want to address uh, this morning with you all. And so if you have your Bibles in Second Corinthians chapter 6, we'll begin reading in verse 14. The scripture says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And now let's go to our Lord in prayer. Our Father God, we come before you once again, and we thank you for your goodness to us, all that you've blessed us in, and Lord, especially in Jesus Christ, who you've given us life. Uh, Lord, we pray that uh, you would help us this morning to understand your word, and Lord, to apply it to our own situation uh, in this day. Lord, we pray for all of your churches, Lord, uh, that you would be with them to help them in uh, the decisions that they'll have to make in the coming days. And Lord, we pray that uh, if there be any in this place or uh, in any of your churches uh, that don't know you, Lord, that you would draw them to be saved, to trust in Jesus Christ and have life. Lord, we pray that you'd be with our missionaries as we always pray. Be with our leaders in this land. Uh, Lord, we pray for uh, those in the Southern Baptist Convention, those that are appointed uh, as a head over uh, the affairs that go on there, that you would help them uh, to uh, do rightly and to, to live as you would have them to live. Uh, Lord, we pray that uh, where each one of us has sinned against you, you'd forgive us. And Lord, that you'd cleanse us and you'd make us fit to do your will this week. And it's in Christ's holy name we pray all this. Amen. So before we get into the passage that we have this morning, I want us to talk a little bit about the harmony that is in the gospel of Jesus. By Jesus Christ, all of his people are united in him and have true fellowship with one another. In Ephesians 2.13 but now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace." And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them that are nigh. For though through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. What Jesus' work here is spoken about, how he came and he gave himself how he came and he took the punishment of sin that was due to us, the sin which kept us at enmity between one another, that separated between peoples. 
He came and he destroyed that sin within us. He paid the penalty. He gave us his life and righteousness. And so in him, we can have unity. Uh, it doesn't matter what we've done in the past, what we did before we came to faith in Jesus Christ. In him, we have a grounds of perfect unity because we both trust in him. We are both loved by him. All of his people have in common Jesus Christ, who has sacrificed for them, who has called them to do his will. In Ephesians 4, verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. By the Spirit uh, being given to us, by the Son dying for us, by the Father's love towards us, we have been brought together into one body, one people, and we can have fellowship with one another on the basis of what Christ has done for us. But this unity, this uh, Christian camaraderie is only found in the gospel of Jesus Christ and in the doctrine which Christ has taught to us. Galatians 1.6 says, I marvel that ye are so soon turned from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have, we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Uh, another gospel, another teaching had been brought into the Galatian church. The Judaizers who were only trying to add uh, one item from the law into the gospel. Just one foreign element, uh, bringing it in to uh, the, and adding it to faith in Jesus Christ. And on this basis, Paul says, let them be accursed. Uh, put them out. Do not uh, have anything to do with them according to the ministry and uh, that Christ will deal with them accordingly. In John 15, verse 7, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, that is, if, if we abide in Christ, the gospel, and his words, his teachings, abide in us, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples." So the, the, Jesus gives two elements here uh, of our unity and our fruitfulness in the ministry. He says if we abide in him, if we trust in him and have life in his name, and if his words abide in us, the doctrine that he taught to us, then we will ask what we will and it will be given to us. He'll give us the things we need for his work. And so shall ye be my disciples. We shall purely follow after Jesus Christ. And apart from this ground, uh, there is no uh, following Christ. There is no uh, being a, a pure church if we don't have these things, the gospel and right doctrine. And so we see that apart from Christ's grace and his teaching, there is no ground of Unity. There is no uh, ground of, of uh, association between peoples. If we do not have the gospel of Christ, and if we do not have the teachings of Christ, then uh, how can we be reconciled? How can we uh, do ministry with one another? And so this is where I want us to look at our passage. We've seen the unity that's in Christ and now let's look at the discord of its antithesis, the doctrines of the world. 
in verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? You notice all of these harsh things that he's saying about the infidel, about the unrighteous, about Belial, about darkness. He's all trying to explain why it is we cannot be unequally yoked together with unbelievers and with the unbelieving world. He's using such, such harsh uh, ways of speaking just about being yoked together, partnering in ministry with the world, with unbelieving uh, men, women, and their ideologies. Notice that he also is giving general examples, not just for individuals, but in general. We can't have anything to do with the ways of darkness, with the ways of Belial. Uh, we can't uh, do uh, ministry in association with those principles. And in verse 16, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Again, he expands it even further. The, the uh, household of God, the church of God, cannot be associated with, with these things, with idols, with Belial, with the ways of the world. Uh, the, these are discordant with the gospel. They don't fit together. Uh, just as light does not fit together with darkness, just as Christ does not fit together with Satan, uh, just like righteousness and unrighteousness are incompatible, and belief and unbelief cannot be reconciled. So cannot the temple of God join themselves together with the unbelieving world. And this is where I want to get to the part that, um, that, that really caused me some uh, difficulty in getting to this point. Uh, and it's only because I've, I've really dug in and, and looked to see what's been going on uh, in our convention uh, as of late. And I'd like us to uh, look at some of those difficulties and uh, think through uh, some things that we might want to think about doing together. I'd first like to uh, say that though I'm talking against some trends in the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, I uh, have nothing wrong with uh, our local uh, association. Uh, we all know uh, the staff up there. We, we all know that they're dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, we've, and I personally have only ever had uh, you know, good experiences with them, good fellowship with them. Nothing that I'm saying here uh, has anything against uh, our friends down the street. Uh, and I hope that it doesn't drive a personal wedge between uh, me and anyone down there. Uh, but these things do need to be said. And so here's the situation in our convention. Uh, there are a few problems I'd like to mention. First, is that there are heavy egalitarian tendencies growing in the Southern Baptist Convention. The biblical doctrine about the roles of men and women in the home and in the church are very plain. In 1 Timothy 2 verse 9, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over um, the man, but to be in silence. The biblical teaching about the, the roles of men and women in the church is that the man represents his household, that he comes into the house of God with his family, and he speaks on behalf of them. Uh, if, if there is any uh, authority to be exercised over men in the church, a man ought to take that role uh, as he is the head of the household, and he 
uh, he uh, uh, represents his household in the church. It's something we talked about last Wednesday. Uh, and so a woman also ought not to teach before a general uh, a general assembly. They, they, they ought not to teach uh, in adult class uh, in, in the, the gathering together of the church. But uh, recently in the Southern Baptist Convention, again, and it's been building for several years, Beth Moore, uh, who is a, a large figure, a large teacher in the convention, is being allowed largely to, to have free reign as far as preaching at Southern Baptist events. Uh, she has even seriously been considered for the role of Southern Baptist, uh, the presidency of the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, which is a role that would entail not only her exercising authority uh, over uh, men, uh, apart from the authority of her uh, and the mediation of her husband in that, uh, but also in preaching at Southern Baptist events. Uh, she has been seriously floated for this, uh, this uh, role, and uh, there are not too many voices within the convention who are opposed to this. Uh, she has uh, also uh, herself uh, come out and, and uh, largely denounced uh, the traditional uh, uh, complementarian view uh, of gender roles in the household. Uh, that is, she is opposed to the idea that, that I've just laid out, that the man represents the household and that the, the woman uh, is, is subject to the man in the household and the church. And so uh, these egalitarian tendencies, uh, growing rapidly, uh, are threatened to overcome the, uh, the convention. Uh, the second issue that I'd like to mention is the adoption of critical race theory in the uh, Southern Baptist uh, Convention. The, the adoption of it, the, 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 it was actually voted on in the convention and adopted as a means of uh, interpreting the scripture. I'd first like to uh, state a biblical doctrine, just as we mentioned earlier, about the grounds of reconciliation between people in Christ. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The, the biblical uh, doc, uh, doctrine for our reconciliation, for our escaping, our alienation from one another is through faith in Jesus Christ coming to him and having our sins forgiven and being reconciled in him. But the Southern Baptist Convention has adopted officially, as I said, critical race theory as a, uh, a tool, they call it an analytical tool, for understanding the scripture. Uh, I'll give a, a brief summary of what critical race theory is. CRT, critical race theory, is a secular philosophical system which has its deepest roots in German idealist philosophy, he Hegelianism, uh, and Marxism, and through the uh, Frankfurt School it has come uh, and, and has been developed uh, into a full theory of uh, a full worldview, essentially. The primary goal of critical race theory is to escape what is in philosophical terms called alienation or the alienation of Geist against itself. Geist is the Hegelian, um, it's, a, it's a sort of a penentheist view that all of the world is either God himself or inside of uh, God in, a, in a, very, uh, a very strict way so that the, the world and God cannot exist without one another that Geist is alienated from itself. Uh, Geist meaning ghost or, or mind uh, is, is alienated from itself because it does not recognize itself in the world. Uh, this was Hegel's idea about how uh, history needs to progress, how we are to, to reach the final end of history is by recognizing that all is 
uh, mind all is Geist. Uh, and through, the, uh, through Marxism and then through the Frankfurt School, this idea was developed into several different, uh, many different categories uh, that people pit against each other as being the alienation of the world against itself. Uh, largely, they strip it of its theological content, but this is uh, the world pitted against itself. And one of these theories, critical race theory, views the two primary uh, principles that are opposed to each other as re being racial, uh, the, the, the races pitted against each other, uh, namely that uh, that whiteness, uh, just as, as we are in this room, that whiteness uh, is, the, uh, is the force of all evil in the world that alienates blackness or, or, or minority groups, uh, and that uh, these two things need to be reconciled by discarding whiteness, by, by getting rid of everything that is white. This is what critical race theory is. Uh, and as a literary theory, a theory of understanding texts, uh, this has been adopted by the Southern Baptist Convention as a way of understanding the scripture. Uh, it's it's a, a theory that is derived from an essentially atheistic philosophy that's been brought in to understand what the scripture says. Uh, in fact, uh, I believe it was last year, uh, or the year before that, uh, Rachel Held Evans, who died uh, last year, uh, actually applied um, thinking that is very similar to this. In fact, it's it's hard for me to believe that she doesn't that she wasn't acquainted with critical race theory, to say that in Mark seven verse twenty four to thirty that Jesus was actually showing himself to have racial bias that he was a racist when the Canaanite woman came asking for healing for her daughter. All of this on the basis of critical race theory, because uh, as Rachel Held Evans viewed it, Christ was uh, a member of the, uh, the privileged class, the privileged race uh, in Israel, and that the Canaanite woman was an oppressed race. And therefore, when, when Christ has this interaction, he shows himself to have racial bias. Uh, and so this, as I said, has been adopted by the Southern Baptist Convention as a way of, of, of understanding and dissecting the Word of God, not on its own basis, but on the basis of this atheistic theory. Another tendency in the Southern Baptist Convention is a softening stance on uh, homosexuality, uh, homosexual sin. The biblical doctrine, Romans 1, 25, is that God changed, that, that they, rather, that the sinner, changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For their, even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. The biblical doctrine is clear that this is vile, it's an abomination, it is not convenient, and it is a product of idolatry, worshiping the creature more than the creator. But there are some hints in the Southern Baptist, not just hints, blatant uh, uh, events happening in the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, which are leading to a softening of teaching on this doctrine. Beth Moore, once again, uh, a teacher in the Southern Baptist, a, a, a woman preacher in the Southern Baptist Convention, has removed material in her past writings which opposes homosexuality. She has removed this recently from her uh, writings, her published works. Uh, she is softening her stance on it. She's preparing to make the the, the move over to that uh, to supporting that lifestyle. Russell Moore also, who is the president 
of the Southern Baptist Convention's Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. He is, he is a, an elected official in the convention, has repeatedly uh, partnered himself with homosexuals to do ministry, including a homosexual Anglican priest called Sam Alberry. Uh, he has, has been softening, uh, well, not just, he, he, he is an appointed uh, elected official in the convention, and he does ministry with them. He affirms them. And this is, again, against what, all that we read in the scripture about this sin. There's also, and I've saved this one for last because it's, it's only really just starting, there are uh, undertones of pro-choice ideology that are just beginning to surface in the convention. Jeremiah 1 verse 4 says that the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. God loved Jeremiah even before he was born. Uh, he, he, he knew him. He had ordained him to a purpose. And, uh, and so to, to take a, an infant's life who is ordained by God, who, who is loved by God before an abomination to the Lord. Exodus 21, 22 also says, if men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished according to the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judge determines. So if, if two men are fighting and that uh, one of them hits a woman that's with child and uh, she gives premature birth, uh, then the, uh, the one who is offending has to pay according to the, the courts and the husband decide is, is what he ought to pay. But if mischief follow, that is, if the child passes, if, if the child dies, then thou shalt give life for life. Uh, it's to be treated as murder in that instance. Uh, it, the, the biblical teaching on abortion is very clear in the law here. And yet, as I said, there are some undertones that are beginning to surface in the convention. Uh, Thomas S. Kidd, who is an appointee at the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, uh, this is an official entity of the SBC, uh, said that it was not a good thing that Donald Trump recently attended the March for Life, that it was not a good thing that he, uh, he uh, has associated himself with uh, the pro-life position. And while perhaps this was a sloppy statement, uh, perhaps he would revoke it later, I'm not sure. Nonetheless, it just goes to show you uh, about how he's been defended recently in the past week over this statement that's been made. And apart from this, there are many other examples of uh, generally sinful attitudes and worldly ideologies that have been entering into the Southern Baptist Convention, especially through Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, who has, which has brought in uh, quite a bit of this ideology and has incorporated it into their curriculums. And so uh, this is uh, antithetical to uh, the unity that's in Christ. We cannot have anything to do in supporting these ideologies. But we have two more verses, three more verses in our passage. And so let's go ahead and look at those together. Uh, rather, two more verses. In verse 17 of our passage, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. The, uh, the comfort that's given to us in this passage, after it's told us to separate ourselves, to come out from among them, is that God will be our help in it. That God will still be with us. God commands us to leave these things, to, to run from them. Revelation 18.4 says, I heard another voice from, say, from heaven saying, 
Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. He says, come out from among her, because God has remembered her sins. Isaiah 52, 11, depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing, go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean, that bear the vessels of the Lord. For ye shall not go out with haste, nor by flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rearward. Uh, he says again, go out, do not touch the unclean thing. Uh, you bear the vessels of the Lord. Uh, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are to, to separate ourselves from the unclean thing. And if we go out, it says we will not go out with haste. We will not go out uh, in disarray, being scattered all over the place. Rather, God will be our rearward. He will go behind us and protect us from that which would seek to hurt us. God promises that he will be sufficient for us, even if we separate ourselves and we suffer for separating ourselves from these things. Matthew 6, 31 says, Take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all those things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Just as we can uh, individually and as households uh, lay hold on this promise of God to take no thought, to know that God provides for us, so as a congregation we can do the same. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, not worldly ideologies, not camaraderie with those who would support worldly ideologies, but seeking God and his kingdom first and his righteousness. And so, believers, this morning, I have a simple point of application for us. And I would set before you three options to consider until our next regular business meeting. The first option, and the one that I would prefer, is that we leave the Southern Baptist Convention because of the wickedness that's been leaking into it. Uh, God says to come out from among them and be uh, separate, and that's what we ought to do. The second option, which is less preferable, but would, uh, would still be a step in the right direction, I believe, is to withdraw all of our monetary support from the cooperative program of the SBC. We can give that to our missionaries. We can use that for God's work in a place where it's not going to go to pay these people salaries, uh, not going to go to bring in this atheistic way of thinking into the church. And of course, the third option would simply be to do nothing, to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, and to give account to God for it. I don't think that there's any other option for us. Uh, as I said, I think we should consider this until the next regular business meeting, and uh, at that time to decide what we ought to do. In Isaiah 52, verse 11, we read, Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing, go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. For ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by fight, uh, flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel shall be your rearward. We can trust in the Lord that he will be faithful if we are faithful to uh, do as he would have us to do. And so, uh, now if there are any unbelievers in here, I'd just briefly like to make a plea to you that you would not be distracted by these things not be put off by this uh, striving for doctrinal purity that we are pursuing. Rather, I would ask that you would see yourself before God and his highest standards, the standards that would judge those who have brought these things into the Southern Baptist Convention, that you are also under his judgment. 
and his requirements of you are great. Revelation 21.8 says that the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Simply being fearful, being unbelieving, uh, being uh, a liar is enough to be cast into God's eternal torment. His requirements on every individual are just as high as on the Southern Baptist Convention. Therefore, you are condemned. Therefore, all man is condemned. And so look to Jesus Christ and have salvation in his name. Romans 10 verse 9 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. If you will trust in him, if you will come to Jesus Christ asking his forgiveness, he will give it to you, and you will not be ashamed on the day of judgment when you stand with his righteousness as your cause. And so I pray that you would come to Christ Jesus and be saved. And again, believers, what we've talked about this morning, I've pained over for a little while. Uh, but I wholeheartedly believe that uh, what's going on in the convention is uh, a downgrade that, that we don't need to be a part of. And so let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you and Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for uh, your provision for us. And Lord, we ask that you would give us strength in this time, Lord, and wisdom uh, to see the signs on the wall, the writing on the wall. Uh, Lord, to uh, leave as you tell us to leave. Uh, Lord, to not touch the unclean thing, but to do as you've asked us and to separate ourselves for your holiness. Uh, Lord, we pray that uh, you would help us to continue to have fellowship with our local churches. Uh, Lord, to uh, even in the future to uh, have collaborations with them, to uh, take the gospel to the world. Uh, and Lord, we pray that they would be uh, understanding of uh, what I've presented here this morning. Uh, Lord, we pray that, again, where we've sinned against you, you'd forgive us, go with us and help us to spread the gospel to those that we know. And Lord, we pray, as we always do, for those who... Uh, couldn't be here this morning, Lord, uh, that you would help them in their infirmities and give them comfort and healing, Lord. Uh, Lord, we love you and thank you for all things. And it's in Christ's name we pray it all. Amen.